So students, today we will learn about insurance waiver and the doctrine of estoppel. I'm sure you study the doctrine of estoppel also in the law of contract. That is there's something called as doctrine of promissory estoppel. Just a moment. Okay, so I was talking about the doctrine of promissory estoppel. Uh, just I was trying to remind you about the contract laws that you must have studied the doctrine of promissory estoppel as an equitable doctrine, even in contract laws. So what is this doctrine of promissory estoppel? If you remember, just to brush your memory a little bit, this doctrine of estoppel, it estops, E-S-T-O-P-S, it estops or stops the party or a person who promises, that is a promiser, from going back on his promise, in simple words, or to put it rightly, from retracting from his promise, right? So it is basically based upon the principle of justice, equity and good conscience and therefore normally in English law we call it as a doctrine which is evolved by the principles of equity right and repeating the doctrine of estoppel that means it stops a person from retracting from a promise or from going back on a promise so let's see how it is applicable for insurance law now when we are talking about insurance we specifically talk about insurance waiver. Waiver is nothing but relinquishing rights, to give up rights pertaining to something. Now, Investopedia defines waiver as a legally binding provision where either party in a contract agrees to voluntarily forfeit a claim without the other party being liable. Now, thereby, waiver is a voluntary relinquishment. That is to give up the rights, give up some rights in the insurance policy, but the insurance policy is a valid policy and the person may relinquish certain rights in the insurance policy. So it could be you know, a waiver of insurance premium by the insurance company where the insurance company may ask the insurer to pay a substantial sum as against a long-term permanent insurance policy and waive the need of paying the periodical premium. So thereby the cost of the premium will be incorporated into the total cost of the policy. So that could be one arrangement where they could, you know, try to cover up the cost in the entire cost, in the total cost of the policy. Next is, it may also happen that the insured may apply for a waiver on reasonable grounds, such as, you know, prolonged sickness, disability, etc. And they say, well, I'm not able to pay, pay premium. So they could ask for a waiver of payment of, of payment or paying of insurance policy for which the proof of such disability or medical certificate must be provided to the insurance company. So thus you could say a waiver of premium is a type of add-on cover and is also called as a rider to the insurance policy contract. So there could be a rider, or the, an, an additional uh, you know, kind of an appendage to the insurance policy contract called a rider, where it would basically talk about waiver of premium as an add-on cover, which can be appended to the insurance policy contract. Thereby, in the above context, a waiver clause will be reflected in an insurance policy or in an additional appendage or in an extra as a rider to the contract that would relieve the policyholder of the obligation to pay further premiums under certain circumstances, for example, sickness of a life insurance policy holder or redundancy if the policy permits waiver upon redundancy, etc. So waiver of a premium may be for a short duration until the person springs back to normal in case of redundancy, etc. That is, if it is a long term. Now, declining a mandatory insurance policy cover by an individual who is entitled to an insurance policy would also amount to a waiver. That is to give up something, to give up the rights in insurance policy. Sometimes declining or, you know, saying, I do not want to be covered by a particular insurance policy cover by an individual. He might say that who may be entitled to an insurance policy would also amount to a waiver of an additional insurance policy. 
Now, say for example, there is B who is A's wife. Now, is offered a health insurance policy by A's company. Now, A can decline it on the ground that B already is offered a health insurance plan by her own employer. Now, in such a case, B will be asked to sign a waiver form that is to you know, give up a particular right that is to be submitted to the insurance company through A's employer and a waivers thereby here, it could be intentional, it could be a voluntary act and being fully aware of the consequence of such waiver. So this waiver can be expressed or implied. Now, what is an example of implied waiver? Say now, if the insurer has been continually accepting delayed payments and it cannot stop accepting delayed payments with a valid notice of its intention of henceforth negating such an acceptance. So if he ha if they have been continu continually accepting delayed premiums, uh, that means they have, uh, you know, uh, accepted that, saying that, okay, you are permitted to, you know, make delayed premiums. So that would be an implied waiver of their own rights. So if the insurer has been continually accepting delayed premiums, it cannot stop accepting delayed premiums without valid notice of its intention of henceforth negating such a uh, such an acceptance. Now, what is a doctrine of estoppel in insurance? Now, a doctrine of estoppel, as I said earlier, it forbids retracting from a promise or going back on a promise or a position or a claim, especially when the promisee acts upon the promise statement to his detriment. So it is basically an equitable, it comes under the principles of, uh, you know, justice, equity, and fairness. It is also called as an equitable doctrine. It comes within the ambit of uh, the laws of equity. It is a defense tool in which the courts stop a person or stop a person from moving backward from his word or promise. It's a very interesting case of comb versus comb. I'm not sure whether you heard about this case. This is, again, a contractual law case. Now, in comb versus comb, Justice Denning, he observed that the doctrine of promissory estoppel works on the principle of equity. However, in a contract, it should not be allowed to displace the principle of consideration. Now, you know that for a contract to be valid, consideration is a must, right? There has to be offer. There has to be acceptance. There has to be consideration. Parties uh, must be competent to contract. And when there is offer plus acceptance, this offer plus acceptance is an agreement and an agreement which is enforceable in law is a contract. Now, for it to be enforceable in law, the concept of consideration must be there. Now, what Justice Denning said in this particular case, comb versus comb, it's a you know, um, age-old case. It's quite an old decision. Way back, uh, you know, uh, the citation it is around 1951, a King's Bench. It comes under King's Bench, decided by the King's Bench those days. So here, Justice Denning said that the doctrine of promissory estoppel, he, it works on the principle of equity. However, in contract, it should not be allowed to displace the principle of consideration. Now, what are the facts of this case? I want you to, you know, find out the facts of this case. It's an interesting case, comb versus comb. Here, uh, there was this Mr. and Mrs. Comb, just, uh, just to, you know, uh, just to give you a little bit of... Uh, uh, you know, the background of this case. There was this husband and wife, Mr. and Mrs. Combe. They were a married couple and uh, the husband's name was Mr. Yasser M. Combe. And uh, he promised his wife, Mrs. Radhika M. Combe, that he would pay her an annual maintenance. The husband said, I will pay you an annual maintenance. That is yearly maintenance. So their marriage finally, one day it fell apart. And they were divorced. Then finally, Mr. Combe was, as usual, he was annoyed. He was angry. He broke up with his wife. He was divorced. So he said, well, now that we are divorced, I, I will not continue to pay my wife. So Mr. Combe, he refused to pay any of the maintenance he had promised earlier. But seven years later, Miss Combe, 
Now, later on, she became Miss Comb, right? So, Miss Comb, she brought an action against Mr. Comb to have the promise enforced. So, here there was no consideration and exchange for the promise. And so, no contract was formed. So, she argued in the court of law that the principle of promissory estoppel does function here. So, she took the defense of promissory estoppel that one cannot retract from the promise as she acted on the promise to her own detriment. Well, the court of first instance agreed, but there was this Justice Denning who said that, no, uh, you know, though it works in the principle of equity, you know, in a contract, the principle of consideration should not be done away with. So the principle of consideration cannot be done away with when we handle cases of contracts. And it depends upon, again, the facts and circumstances of the case. So here he said that it may be true that the the wife, you know, did forbear from suing the husband on areas for seven days, but this forbearance was not at the request of the husband. So he said that there was absence of proof of any request that is expressed or implied by the husband that the wife should forbear from applying to the court for maintenance. And there was no consideration whatsoever for the husband's promise. So, so this is a kind of a classic case, comb versus comb, where Justice Denning observed that the doctrine of promissory estoppel, it works in the principle of equity. However, in contract, it should not be allowed to displace the principle of consideration. Now, what about insurance contracts? Now, in insurance contracts, the insurer is not permitted, that is the insurance company, is not permitted from going back or retracting from his covenanted obligations and that the insured has all reason to believe that the insurer would comply with the contractual obligations and has relied on the assurance and has acted upon the contract to his or her detriment, thereby shunning from commitment or going away from the commitment is unacceptable and would be construed as an act that can be contested in law. Now, in Middlesex Mutual Insurance Company versus Levine, the court upheld or substantiated the principle of promissory estoppel as being applicable to insurance law. And they maintained that for relying on the doctrine of promissory estoppel in insurance contracts, the insured must have relied upon the representation to his or her detriment. So the important factor to be considered here is that the insured must have relied upon the representation to his or her detriment or something that has caused loss to the person. The person has relied on it and as a result, there is some loss that has incurred to the person. So estoppel can be promissory estoppel or even equitable estoppel. For example, an insurance company cannot receive a late premium a payment and then cancel the policy on the ground that premium was not paid within the specified period. Yet another example is that the insurance agent represented falsely to the insured about the existence of a particular insurance coverage based on which the insured purchased the policy. Then in such a circumstance, the insurance company will be stopped from not complying with the justified claim of the insured. In yet another case of Emmanuel versus U.S. Fidelity and Guarantee Company, here, the court observed that this representation must have led the insured to believe that coverage existed. Now, in a U.S. case, Professional Underwriters Insurance Company versus Freitas and Sons Corporation Incorporation, the court held that no estoppel when insured has never even inquired about coverage and could not meet the threshold requirement of a promise or representation. In Homebrush versus American Chambers Life Insurance Company, the court held that representations by an agent as to coverage under an insurance policy made before the policy is assured does not stop the insurer from denying coverage. So what happens when the defense of promissory estoppel is not available? So, of course, the next course would be the normal traditional course of defense, either to deny the existence of coverage or to claim extension of coverage. And this was held in State Farm Mutual Auto Insurance versus Henestrosa. So this was all about, in short, how the principle of 
you know, promissory estoppel would work in case of insurance contracts. So next, let's move on to measure of recovery. This is a short chapter. And for the examination, you can expect a short note on this. So measure of recovery of claim. So um, the measure of recovery of claim in an insurance policy would be proportionate to the insurable interest and the loss or the damage that is caused vis-a-vis -vis the coverage contracted in a valid insurance policy contract. So what are the factors to be considered in measure of recovery? Now, the loss or damage would be ascertained or evaluated based on the valuation of the property that is damaged in case of property insurance, automobile insurance, or even fire insurance. In case of fire insurance, the value of certain goods that would be at the time of loss. So they, what they would do is deduct the depreciated value. For example, it's a house and the house is entirely burnt. So everything in the house is burnt. So they would you know, roughly estimate the depreciated value of a particular property. And this current value will be ascertained. And then accordingly, the claim amount would be calculated and disbursed. Next is depreciation would be considered to calculate the final claim amount for disbursal or release of amount. So current market value is a factor that would be deliberated or calculated as a tool to measure recovery. So the factor of usefulness of the destroyed and insured product of property is also known as obsolescence would also be measured. That is how old is a product? Or uh, how old is a destroyed property? So obsolescence would also be measured. So the factor of coinsurance, if any, especially in health insurance. So in case uh, of health insurance, if there is any other person who is also sharing the health insurance, whether there is coinsurance policy, so that factor would also be considered in you know in uh measuring recovery so in how they are going to calculate recovery so in case of a property depreciation would be cal calculated then uh, obsolescence would be calculated how old is a property and in case of health insurance co uh, coinsurance would be calculated and in case of more than one insurer payment of claim would be disbursed on a pro rata basis that is equally however on a pro rata basis next is they would you know assess whether uh, the property is destroyed intentionally or there is an element of fraud in it or whether it is self-induced destruction of property just to earn something out of insurance claims. So, of course, fraud is a offense in the eyes of law. So they would assess whether there is element of fraud in it, whether it is self-induced destruction of property, whether somebody wants to earn out of the insurance claim and so on. Next, due consideration may be given to appraisal clauses and arbitration clauses, if any, in the insurance contract. Now, the arbitration clause serves as a dispute redressal mechanism. Now, what is this arbitration clause? Now, they would normally they would have an arbitration clause that in case of any dispute or conflict between the parties, then the parties would go and knock. Uh, you know, uh, would not go and knock the doors of the normal courts, but instead they would go in for arbitration mechanism. That means an arbitrator would be appointed and the dispute may be referred to arbitration that is faster and more convenient than the courts. But of course, uh, in my opinion and experience, like arbitration is a little bit more expensive than the normal courts. Well, but an arbitration clause normally would find its place in an insurance contract and it serves as a dispute redressal mechanism where an arbitrator is appointed and the dispute may be referred to arbitration that is faster and more convenient than the courts. It may be convenient, but it is um, a little expensive, more expensive than the courts, of course, than the normal courts. Then appraisal cause clauses call for appointment of an appraiser to settle conflicts pertaining to the value of the claim and not on the aspect of liability as a whole. Uh, in case we get disconnected, please join back. Next, let's move on to insurer's right 
and duty to defend. Before we move further, do you have any questions on this, on measure of recovery and uh, the previous chapter that is a doctrine of estoppel in insurance? Like how, uh, you know, what is insurance waiver and how the doctrine of estoppel operates in insurance contracts and uh, the measure, measure of recovery? Okay, so I assume or presume rather that you do not have questions. So let's move forward. So next is insurer's right or duty to defend. Now, the insurance company or the insurer is under a duty to defend a policy holder against third par party suits which are instituted against the policy holder where the subject matter of the insurance comes under litigation. So here the question is not about what and who is right or wrong. Invariably, when the insured or the policy holder faces a legal battle with regards to the subject matter or propose the subject matter covered under a valid insurance policy, the insurer is customarily obligated to defend the insured. So here we have the four corner rule. Or sometimes it's also called as the eight corner rule. Now, what is this rule? To determine or to find out whether the insurer is obliged to defend the insured in a third party litigation, the pages and the clauses of the insurance contract need to be meticulously read. That means you have to carefully read the terms and conditions that are there in an insurance contract. So within the ambit of insurance, the contract is the answer to the question of whether the insurer, that is the insurance company, is required to defend the insured, that is the one who holds the policy. So this is called as a four corner rule or even the eight corner rule of insurance. That is whether the insurer or the insurance company is obligated to defend the insurance policy holder or the insured in a third party litigation. Any questions on this? Okay, so we'll move further. So ambiguous claims, remote claims and litigation beyond the purview of the subject matter of insurance cannot compel the insurer to participate and defend the policyholder beyond the ambit of the subject matter or purview of the subject matter of insurance cannot compel the insurer to participate and defend the policy holder. Now, the implication of the insurer Exercising the duty to defend the insured and the insured's right to be defended to the extent of the subject matter of the policy that is the insured under a valid insurance policy. Now here, should the court decree in favor of the third party and the decree be executed, then the insurance company will be expected to pay the entire amount under the policy contract to which the insured is legitimately entitled under that specific insurance scheme. Consequently, nothing remains or something or very little remains partially to be disbursed to the policy holder. If the insurer or the insurance company has already satisfied the claim prior to the litigation, then the insurance company certainly will not be made a party to the litigation under an expired insurance contract. At third, in case the insurance company fails, this is the next scenario, in case the insurance company fails to defend such a litigation during the subsistence, that is the existence of a valid insurance contract, then the court would make the insurance company liable for any additional costs borne by the policyholder. And in that regard, such as say, attorney fees, costs, etc. So the court may also extend damages to the insured for the mental agony suffered by the insured for the insurer's breach of duty towards the insured. So these are the Im implications of the insurer exercising the duty to defend the insured and the insured's right to be defended to the extent of the subject matter of the policy 
that is the insured under a valid insurance policy that is during the subsistence or existence of an insurance policy. Now, for breach of duty or even negligence of the insured insurance company in exercising its duty, in this context, the courts may impose, you know, uh, pecuniary damages or, uh, you know, in monetary terms, monetary damages that may even exceed the cost of the value of the policy. Sometimes the insurance company, again, they might come up with a defense and they may protect themselves against such an allegation of failure to defend by a provision to that effect in the insurance contract, such as waiver clause. They can add a waiver clause or execute a right or additional document that is appended to the insurance contract on the waiver. So in the alternative, the insurer, uh, alternative, the insurer can seek as a precautionary step, a declaratory judgment action against the insured, the policyholder, and determine the coverage of the policy, etc., in the pursuit of safeguarding against any future claims that may exceed the policy limit, apprehensive of a failure to defend in case of being impleted as a party to a third party litigation in which the subject matter of the policy is made a part of. And then the third option before the insurer is the issue of the reservation of rights letter in lieu of waiver document with the intention of informing the insured the policyholder of not intending to participate in such external claims but instead encouraging the policy holder to seek the advice of a lawyer in that direction should such a need or a situation arise so they can uh, you know have a clause either they could add a waiver clause or they could execute a rider to that effect or they could have a precautionary step like having a declaratory judgment action against the policyholder or in the pursuit of safeguarding against future claims they may, they may exceed the policy limit apprehensive of a failure to defend uh, and being impeded as a party to a third party litigation in which the subject matter of the policy is made part of and the next option would be uh, in an issue of a reservation of rights letter in lieu of a waiver document Now, what is the concept of reinsurance? Now, reinsurance is a situation or an arrangement where the insurer becomes the insured by transferring partly or wholly risks that is undertake that it has undertaken to cover in certain circumstances to another insurance company or insurer by executing a valid reinsurance contract and thus would be referred to as reinsured. So it's also called as stop loss insurance to avoid carrying a heavy load of risks and share it with another insurance company under a legitimate arrangement by executing a valid contract for consideration and here in consideration would mean premium so that effect is called a reinsurance contract. So the backing of another insurance company, just in case we get disconnected, please join back. The backing of another insurance company is sought by an insurance company when it is unable to manage the load of risk and financially cover those risks or pecuniarily cover those risks. So the subject matter of the reinsurance contract here is insurance liability. Now, in Union Central Life Insurance Company versus Lowe, the court held that this involves the principle of indemnity. What is principle of indemnity in simple terms? To make good the laws. So this concept is distinct from coinsurance or multiple insurances sought by the insured. Now, reinsurance is the insurance policy cover obtained by insurance companies. In Becky versus Cosmopolitan Life Insurance Company,